Right. Right. Let's calm down. Ooh, that worked. Very good. This is the problem with giving people food. The energy levels revive. Getting, start getting surly in the audience. Right, OK, so we spent a lot of time um, this morning talking about um, the challenges of high growth, of low growth even, and high inequality, and the context in the 2020s within which the country will be trying to navigate those rather big challenges. Um, uh, as several people said this morning, obviously, the objective here isn't to produce some charts, it's to try to force ourselves to think about what anyone should actually do about all of that. And that's our focus in this session um, uh, this afternoon. And we've got a bit longer till uh, 2.15 for this session, and then we're going to, having discussed what on earth the Conservative Party thinks an economic strategy for the 2020s might look like, we're going to have the same conversation about the um, uh, Labour Party with Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, in conversation with Stephanie Flanders at uh, 2.15. So that is the plan. As I said this morning, Go on Slido, put your questions in under hashtag stagnation nation. Right, so the last two chapters of the book, which I know you all read during lunch, there cover what would a plausible economic strategy, not for any country, but specifically for the United Kingdom in the 2020s, uh, look like. Then, and then would it make any difference, right? What is the prize? Or, or should we all just like calm down and kind of get used to our stagnation? It's not that bad. We kind of have air conditioning-ish. Um, so society can get through these difficult times. So that is the plan for this session today, to go through those two uh, chapters. First of all, you're going to hear from Dan Tomlinson, a senior economist at the Resolution Foundation, giving you a quick summary of what is in those uh, chapters. And then we've got a brilliant panel made up of some of the commissioners from the inquiry and some, other, some people working on the inquiry and some people who have been uh, encouraging people to think seriously about the UK economy for a while. They, um, so first of all, you're going to hear from Dame Carolyn Furban, former Director General of the CBI and Commissioner. Uh, for this project. Martin Wolf, Chief Economics Commentator at the Financial Times, who told you what the answer was years ago if you got your subscription. Uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, then you can hear from Frances O'Grady, General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress, until she disgracefully deserts us in <laughs> when, January? End of End of December. December. End of December. Okay. Well, we've all got used to loss by then. Um, uh, and then you're going to hear from Professor Henry Overman, who is the Research Director at the Centre for Economic Performance, and so one of the leaders of the actual inquiry project team. So I hope that's what everyone was expecting, because that is what you're going to get. Right, Dan, what's in the book? Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I'm going to tell you what's in some of the chapters in the book. So, um, we need to get serious is the main <laughs> message that comes from chapter four of the book, which you can leaf to, I'm sure, um, if you're here, or you can go on the PDF online if you can download it. It's very big um, to read as I'm going. But the big task is to end stagnation, which we're defining as uh, low growth and, and high income inequality. And so ending those things is what we try and set a plausible economic strategy for the country. Um, we try and provide the outlines of that in chapter four. And I'm going to, in 15 minutes, try and run through both that and some, of, um, some optimism at the end as to what we could gain if we were to able to close the gap with some of our competitor countries um, in terms of uh, income for households across the distribution. <coughs> so getting serious, what does that look like? Well, to start with, it means being serious about just sort of the fundamentals of our economy. I think some are unserious in saying that we're all about financial services, when actually uh, financial services have fallen as a share of our exports um, over the past decade from 12% to 9% um, between 2009 and 2019. And others, particularly here, I'm thinking of our politicians who are likely to say that we need to revive manufacturing, uh, talk of the march of the makers in uh, years gone by. And actually, when we talk to the public, as we've done as part of uh, this project about this, people are much more realistic that our route to growth and prosperity and where the good jobs are is in the service sector and not in manufacturing, which is not where our strength lies. And it's also not where you get that many jobs, um, in part because it is so high, because high value added manufacturing is high productivity, there's not many jobs in it. And our strength instead lies in services. And we are a services superpower as a country. It's not something that is discussed, nowhere near as much as people may discuss that Germany is a manufacturing superpower. And as this chart shows, um, we are the second largest exporter of services in the world. 
second only to America, exporting $400 billion of services uh, in 2019. And what's really important to note here is that this specialism is persistent over time. It's very difficult to change, and it will cost a lot of money and investment to try and change it. Seven in 10 of the products that the UK was most specialized in in 2000, in 1989, were still in the top 10 in 2019. So this is really difficult to change. It's also a really broad-based specialism. It's not just about finance, as I was saying, but about the creative industries, ICT, and a range of professional and business services. Service economies are also on average richer than manufacturing ones, so this specialism isn't the thing that's holding us back as a country. And in fact, demand grew faster in our key export industries than in China's in the decade to 2019, while China's exports grew twice as fast as ours. So what does, um, what does recognizing that we are an unusually uh, service-led economy mean? Well, it means that you then move to thinking that actually a serious route to doing better as a services economy is to revive our big cities outside of London and make them a success to make, to make a success of being services dominated. We saw a version of this chart this morning from Greg, um, those of you who've been with us all day, where we just showed you the top bubbles, which are now coloured gold. But you can see here, this is the productivity of... Um, Dif of different places in, in a selection of advanced economies, including the UK. And if you look at that big bubble, around $74,000, you can see Manchester. Manchester is a lot less productive than London. And in fact, all of England's big cities outside London have productivity below the national average, which is certainly not the same in France, where you can see Lyon and Toulouse there, closer to Paris, also very high productivity compared to Manchester. And then you can see Germany at the bottom here, Munich and Frankfurt, very highly productive cities. Um, and this, um, and improving the productivity of our cities outside London is also quite a good route to shared prosperity for a country like the UK that is geographically actually quite small. Um, if you look at the OECD data, you can see that 69% of us live in cities or their hinterlands compared to 56% of those in France and a much lower percentage in Italy. So we, we can get more bang for our buck as well, not just because of services and because services and agglomeration effects mean that we should focus on cities, but also uh, because we're, we're small and if we can connect places to cities, then even more people can benefit from them. But we're not really serious about this either, to be honest, because we're not honest about the scale of investment that would be required to transform places like Manchester and Leeds and Birmingham. In one of the papers that we uh, mentioned in the book and has been published as part of this, uh, we show that halving Manchester's productivity gap with London, so its bubble moved up towards where Edinburgh is, would involve 500,000 extra workers in Manchester, an 11 percentage point increase in the graduate share, and tens of billions of pounds of investment. But investment is another thing that uh, we are lacking. This has been discussed a lot today. It's worth just pausing on the fact that really this is about business investment, not at, at the moment on current plans, and of course plans are a bit up in the air at the moment, but on current plans the government is set to increase public sector investment to its highest uh, rates as a share of GDP uh, since the 1970s. But business, inv business investment is where Britain is really lacking. This, the, on the left-hand side here, we compare the UK to Germany, France and the US, where business investment is at 13% compared to 10% in the UK. And we've shown as part of uh, our work that persistently low investment in the UK explains almost all, of the almost all of the gap in productivity between the UK and France. So there's a lot to be had from uh, us getting better at investment, particularly in the private sector. We also um, are not serious about the right things when it comes to human capital investment either. There's a lot of discussion about whether we're doing too much um, investment in our human capital when actually, and also the downsides of that for poorer places with lots of people leaving, people think that's happening. But actually this chart shows you that that really is not the case. Um, there's a lot to look at here, lots of different dots and lines as we like at Resolution Foundation. But if you look at age 19 uh, on this chart, you can see that those in the most deprived parts of the country are two and a half times less likely to leave their, their hometown, their, um, the, the, 
the place where they are at age 19 to go off to higher education uh, than those um, in the least deprived parts of the country. That's 17% versus over 40%. That's a massive difference. So it's not that we've got people flooding, uh, people leaving left behind places, it's that they're staying um, and they're not, they're, they're not being able to leave to access those higher education opportunities elsewhere. And we also get it wrong when we get into arguments in general about whether we're educating too many people, when actually we know that the pace of human capital progress in the UK is slowing and workplace training, for example, has fallen by a fifth in the 2010s. Moving on to talk about uh, the inequality gaps in, in the UK, we need to be just as serious about them as we are about uh, tackling low growth, uh, in part because people really care about these gaps. As this chart shows, six in 10 people say that the inequality between places and, and, and of income and wealth is the most serious, it's helpful that they ask that, most serious um, issue when it comes to inequality in the country. But also, we should be realistic, and I'm sure the panel will get to discussing this as well, about the fact that a strategy that puts services and cities sort of at its front <coughs> is likely to actually push up on uh, income and place-based gaps rather than bring them down. So we need to work extra hard to combat that. And I think um, the place where you should start when you think about in inequality in Britain is, is jobs. And good jobs should be an explicit goal of an economic strategy to help Britain make a success of this decade rather than something that flows by accident from some of the other things that you might want to do. And we've been talking today about stagnant pay growth in the UK, but I think also we should recognise that there's been sort of stagnant or static policy when it comes to the labour market over the past 15 years or so, with, with the welcome exception of the minimum now national living wage, um, because not much has changed in terms of our policies and our support for particularly low paid workers, but, we, but over that same time period and longer we can see that worker power has declined in the UK, trade union membership has, has fallen um, quite, quite significantly, and some estimates which we discuss um, suggest that that could be costing, the lack of worker power in the UK could be costing workers as much as £100 a week in lost earnings. And there are also unacceptable, and, um, there are also unacceptable levels of uncertainty and insecurity in our labour market today. That's what these clocks are illustrating for you here, if you're wondering. Half of shift workers um, in Britain receive less than a week's notice for their shifts. Um, and as well as improving labour market regulations and enforcement across the board um, to tackle some of those problems, um, we can also, uh, we think, be more proactive about making some of the jobs that we know are going to grow in this decade, so green jobs and jobs in social care, making them good jobs. So as was discussed earlier, we could pay our social care workers more, but we can regulate these jobs um, more broadly to ensure that they're good jobs um, as, as they continue to take up a larger share of employment in the economy. So the good jobs element of any future strategy isn't getting much of the headlines this week, but obviously a lot of people are talking about tax. Um, with lots of proposals uh, to bring down the overall tax burden, which is worth noting is actually um, lower here than in many of our comparator economies. But the problem we actually have when it comes to tax is that tax rises have been focused on earnings when they themselves have been stagnant, while other revenues for raising taxes just haven't really been explored. And this, uh, this chart, which I think David said was one of his favorite charts in the report, um, really helps get at one of those things. So the, uh, the, the red line shows um, how much household wealth has increased as a share of GDP since, uh, since the 1960s. And you can see it's gone up from around three times GDP to eight times over this time period since uh, the early 1980s. A massive surge in wealth in Britain. And yet taxes on wealth have remained a flat at, at around 3% of GDP. So the axes are very different here. Um, on, this, on this chart. Um, and our tax system also has a range of other wrinkles and allowances um, that, um, if we're serious about raising revenue effectively in the 2020s, need to be tackled rather than ignored. Um, and before coming on to think about um, what could be achieved if, if um, we were to up our game um, in the way that we've uh, been discussing today, I did want to talk about the welfare state, where I think, again, not being serious is... Um, 
is, is something that we're seeing uh, from some people this week in terms of focusing on uh, people who are out of work and fretting about whether or not our benefit levels are too high and there's too many people um, having a nice time on benefits, when actually we know um, that there's very little in the way of a cushion um, from our benefit system when people lose their jobs. Um, and this chart shows uh, for a single person that doesn't have any children on, on the average wage, if they lose their job in, in the UK, on average, uh, they'd, they'd uh, receive from, from the welfare system 40% of their earnings in, in support, compared to much higher rates of replacement in other countries, such as Portugal and the Netherlands at the top of this chart, where um, on average they'd be at 75% of their previous earnings. Um, and that's because the uh, unemployment benefits in the UK are, are very low, and they've been falling as a share of average earnings. They're now at a record low relative to average earnings at, at just 13%. Um, more broadly, and uh, related to that, but also a product of uh, specific policy decisions as well, we know that pre-pandemic, almost half of families in the UK with three or more children were in poverty, and that's increased from one-third um, of families in uh, 2012. So any economic strategy that claims to be serious about reducing uh, income inequality and financial hardship will need to take a different approach here. Just a few more slides then to finish on um, whether a richer and fairer Britain is in fact possible. Um, if something like a strategy that we've begun to outline today and we'll be doing a lot more work on in the second phase of the project was to be implemented. The gloomsters out there, there may be some of you in this room, um, might say that while well, Brexit has created the economy um, and we're not, that's just too much of a big headwind. Um, some others might say that the path, and this is what this path's doing for you here, the path to uh, higher growth um, in advanced economies has got steeper it's more difficult now for advanced economies to, to grow. This was a discussion that I think Greg was having this morning uh, due, due to some big structural reasons, and so we should just, we should just give up and go and enjoy the sunshine rather than stay in, a, stay in this nice warm room. But I want to take you through some charts that might give us some optimism. Uh, the, and this is, a bit, uh, this is a bit of a paradox in some sense, in part because we have fallen behind so far. Um, there is a lot of room to catch up across both the inequality dimension and the income dimension. And I think this chart really helps get at that. So on the vertical axis here, you can see we've ranked countries from uh, poor to rich. You can see the US at the top there, uh, average household incomes of $50,000, UK there in the middle. Lots of countries are richer than us. Also, lots of countries are more equal than us. You can see right in the end, Denmark, Belgium, Norway, much more equal in terms of the, their income in inequality. Um, and so moving into that quadrant would be a good thing for Britain. Um, and we don't, we don't have to compare ourselves to the sort of best in class anymore. We don't have to be US or Norway. Um, and we pick five sort of broadly comparable countries, so Canada, Australia, Netherlands, Germany, and France. And you can see, yes, they're doing better than us, but they're not doing a lot better. And I think probably lots of you, I, I definitely thought this before we started to do this research, think that we are, we are sort of on a par with these countries. Well, this chart shows you, A, that, that we're not really anymore, but B, um, I can show you that if we were to become a bit more like those countries, that there, there are a lot of gains to be had. So one, the first set of bars show you, uh, on average, if, if our income level was just to increase to the average income level in those five countries, we'd all be 21% richer, which is quite a lot. Um, the second set of bars shows you what would happen if the UK's income shares, so the bottom fifth, middle, and the top fifth, were to be the same as the average in those five comparator countries? Because as, as you saw in the previous chart, these countries are all more equal than us. And on average, that would mean a 20% boost to incomes at the bottom, a boost in the middle, and, and a fall at the top. But if you combine both of those things, which the third set of bars does, it makes a really big difference. So there's a really quite striking difference between the UK and these countries that we think are similar to us. The lowest income households would be over 40% better off. Uh, middle income households would be 30% better off, which equates to £8,800 a year. And so that is the size of the prize that is attainable if we were to make a success of renewing our economic strategy in this decade. Very good. Thank you very much, Dan.
it's a good lesson for all of us in life that you don't need to be the best. Just not being rubbish is like makes a lot of difference. The, um, uh, right. On that optimistic <laughs> note, uh, Carolyn, you you know represented British business in some very straightforward times. The, um, it's all gone very well. Basically, you oversaw actually a lot of this stagnation. So, mm. you know, <laughs> I, I don't think you were on performance-related pay, but over to you. Oh, well, I mean, first of all, Dan, absolutely cracking analysis. And you somehow managed to combine, I think, a fantastic analysis with some hope. Because I think there's that idea that we can uh, grow our way out and improve our income distribution in ways that aren't kind of stellar, but they get us to uh, somewhere that's an awful lot better is a really good starting place. But, Torsten, you gave me the challenge of talking about growth and how we get there, because I think that is the name of the game. We can grow our way out of here. And I think that uh, it is quite easy to see growth and inequality as trade-offs. And actually, if I think about you know, the people I represented from business for, for, for all of those years, they absolutely go hand in hand. A growing business can pay better. It can offer more progression. It can introduce fairer work policies. And you get better jobs. So I think, although I'm going to talk about growth and others will talk about inequality, in my view and my experience, they absolutely go hand in hand. And um, I think what you've shown incredibly clearly in this analysis is there's no silver bullet. There is no one thing that is going to fix uh, everything. And as they say, hope is not a strategy. Um, but um, what I think, if there was a silver bullet, or perhaps there's a silver phrase, I think it is business investment, private sector investment, and how we get that going. And so what I'm going to do in my few minutes is just imagine that actually I've got all of my old CBI members behind me. What would they be telling you right now that would really make a difference to their ability to invest? Because there are one and a half million businesses in this country. They're all making daily decisions about whether they invest money here or they put it in the bank, or they invest it overseas, what would make a difference? And I think I'm going to suggest three things that any government, and who knows who they're going to be, uh, could do uh, right now. Um, the first is we've got to stop the policy churn and the change. The first thing that my guys and gals behind me would say is there has been so much policy churn uh, over the last, and it's not just the last five years, it's the last 25 years, um, in all areas of skills policy, infrastructure. Um, so when I was looking back at the uh, training policy that the gov successive governments have had over the last 30 years, uh, we were accused of not investing enough in training. I look back at policy, in 30 years there have been 29 government changes in skills policy. We had an industrial strategy council for, I think it was 18 months, and it was abolished. Greg Clark, who's come in as leveling up, new leveling up minister, he produced an industrial strategy that was this thick, that was thrown in the bin. Is he going to revive it? So if you're sitting there as a business, they said to me day in, day out, tell us what the plan is, stick to it, and stop changing it every five minutes. And, and actually, as I began to think about it, you, one of the things that you say in the report, Torsten, is we can't just keep blaming the politicians. Um, it's nice, it's easy. But actually, is there something structural in the UK that explains why we have such policy instability? And I've come to the view that there is. And I think one of the things that we don't have in this country is a proper, proper structure of social partnership. We don't have a proper way of bringing uh, workers, uh, unions, business, other social partners into the policy debate. And actually, a lot of those peers that are growing faster than we are do. So one suggestion I have is let's create something that is more uh, conducive to policy consistency. And let's look at a social partnership model. It's very interesting that um, in Wales they're doing exactly that. So suggestion one, we've absolutely got to stop the churn. Secondly, we've got to do fewer, bigger, better things. There is such fragmentation. And the, the two areas of policy where, again, my uh, CBI members behind me would say make a real difference, skills policy. Now, you hear it again and again and again, but actually, we are still not in the right place. And the area that I would focus on is the reskilling of uh, probably nine in 10 workers to uh, do the jobs of the future. 
And um, that has, um, again, been subject to a lot of change. Uh, Damien Hines and Philip Hammond set up something, it bit the dust. But a consistent policy around reskilling for a digital net zero world. Um, uh, net zero would be the second area where we need long-term policy. That's already <coughs> been covered really well by Nick Stern uh, this morning. But fewer, bigger, better strategies and skills would absolutely be at the heart of it. And the third area I would really focus on to sort of get that sort of big surge in investment would be restoring some of the openness in the British economy. So we've gone backwards. Um, coming out of the EU, it's done, we accept it, it's absolutely uh, where we are, but it, it, has, it has closed our economy down and we have not replaced that with new trade deals in any shape or form. So three things there. We must fix our relationship with the European Union. That is affecting trade. It is creating friction. It's about building relationships. It's about building new trade agreements. It's about solving Ireland. Um, we also need to use our position at the WTO to get services trade deregulated. We are and can be an even greater services superpower. Use our new leverage. We've got a place at the table. Use it. And the third thing, I think, is resolving our incredibly difficult um, relationship with the emerging markets, China, India, the Middle East, in terms of how we align our values as a country with the need for trade. And um, it's difficult. You know, we care very much about uh, human rights abuses in China. We care very much about uh, human rights uh, challenges in the Middle East. But we need to find a way of engaging and trading and building markets that we have uh, lost uh, in many ways through, through our decisions recently. So I think if you did those three things, and you did them with conviction and with seriousness, I do like that word, I think you could see a surge in investment and get that 9% of GDP, or well, that 10% of GDP heading towards 13%. Those are the jobs of the future. Investment is the flywheel of the economy. And I think you could start to see the growth that we need. Very good, thank you very much, Carolyn. Over to you. Um, so first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, I have to say, Torsten, you know, I, I basically think what we do as journalists is completely ludicrous, um, trying to sort out issues of immense importance in 800 words. But sorting out the future of British economy in seven minutes is a challenge. You can um, do it. You can do uh, it. I've got total confidence. Uh, so my, uh, well, I have two introductory comments. Um, first. The beautiful chart you had there convinced me that at least one of my columns, very old column, which you, most of you surely have never read, uh, was actually right. It was probably my most controversial. It was not that the UK should become Singapore, but London should. Um, uh, that was very controversial, and clearly not in the direction of leveling up, rather getting out. The more serious point I make is my meta view is that the performance of the UK economy for much of the post-war period, remember where we were in the late 40s, I won't go into that, and particularly again in the last 15 or so years, proves, I think, that we're, we're, we have neither the immense and must be recognized strength of US businesses, nor uh, the capacity for serious, stable, um, sensible, common sense policy making of the social market economy econ systems. And I think this is basically a social and political system problem. And since it's basically got worse through my lifetime, not better, I have no longer any belief it will improve. And when I look at the current Tory campaign, which is incomparably the worst of this kind, I think, in British history, and I studied it. Uh, uh, so that was part of my life. I certainly am not optimistic. But if I were, so those are the introductory marks, I would say the following. First, growth is important. I think my dear friend Richard Laird might challenge me on this, but I believe we can't really run a stable democratic society without growth, which should be, of course, sustainable and inclusive. I won't go say any more about either that because I don't have time. The second point I would make is reversing um, long slides of this kind is really hard to do. And I completely endorse what has been said, which is you have to get a lot of things right. There isn't, 
it was easier for South Korea when I first went in 72 because everything was so far behind the curve. We, were, we aren't. It's much more difficult for us. And we shouldn't pretend that there is something very obvious we can do which will turn this around, for instance, like cutting taxes. Uh, third, uh, basic policy has to have a few pretty obvious characteristics. It has to be predictable. Uh, it has to take into account res using resources efficient, efficiently, and Richie has got something right, macroeconomic stability actually matters. Uh, being a, a, a Latin American economy is no fun. Don't go there. And we have been pretty close to it from time to time. Then on policy, here are my favorite ideas in policy. Obviously, we have to raise the investment rate, and my own view for a long time it's obvious to the public sector, the private sector, is capital spending should be fully expensed. End of subject. Every economist knows this. Debt, by the way, should not be, but that's another matter. I won't go into that. Um, second, we need to raise savings in our economy because we already have a whacking great current account deficit, which is a bit scary at the moment. And uh, we can't uh, raise investment without raising savings, and that will be, have to be private and public, so that means that has to look at public finances. They do matter. Uh, but we have to raise savings, and I think the obvious place to do that, apart from, uh, is to look at our pension system. Our new pension system, I think, is um, the, the um, defined contribution system is multiply defective, um, but one of them is that the contribution rates are clearly too low, and uh, and they should be motivated to be higher. I think we need collective defined contribution plans because there's a real problem with imposing all the risks on individuals. And we've assassinated the defined ben benefit system with ludicrous uh, regulation. And the result has made the British capital markets, in my view, the most effective pretty well in the, the Western world. And you can see that in multiple things. We Land markets are a catastrophe. And uh, these are the biggest distortions in our system. And of course, it goes without saying that deciding to wage a trade war with our principal trading partners indefinitely uh, in order to ensure that the, one of the few regions of the country that is actually seems to be working economically should be blow up, namely Northern Ireland, is insane even by the standards of these in imbeciles. <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally, 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 uh, I know I'm sure I've gone over. I, I think we should think about some institutions. Um, and I'll just focus on uh, two aspects of this. Um, the OBR was a very good institution. Um, I think the government should have something somewhere in it, probably not the Treasury, but perhaps <coughs> it has to be the Treasury, a serious unit trying to find growth strategy and changing it. And, adjust, and I simply ask the question, what the hell do you think the world will look like in 10 years' time? We will change our mind. And what should we be doing to prepare ourselves for it? Almost everything that goes on the Treasury, in my view, is irrelevant and useless. And I've thought of this for half a century. I don't have the time to go. In. But this is important. And the final thing, I do think we should massively increase public investment, but not by saying, ah, the high-speed rail. We really must do that. How much does it cost? Who cares? We should do proper uh, program planning and assessment of using of our investment resources against other things, which we don't do either. The basic point is, as, you said, as was indicated, if we were serious, it would make a difference, but I'm afraid we're not. Very good. <laughs>to be the uplifting session, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mention that before we started, but thanks for it. And any Treasury civil servants in the room, I'm sorry, there'll be therapy available afterwards uh, to get you through this difficult afternoon. Right, Francis, any more uplift to offer? Um, well, first of all, <gasps> thank you, Resolution Foundation, Torsten, Daniel, uh, thank you very much indeed for that presentation. I think a couple of the key messages I took from it, one was... Um, there are political choices to be made. Um, so you mentioned manufacturing, for example, and manufacturing has shrunk in many countries, but why is it shrunk so much faster and further in the UK? There are kind of choices 
to be made. And secondly, uh, if you think about those big challenges that we've just heard so much about, big tech, Brexit, net zero, uh, I kind of uh, wonder about energy rationing mm -hmm. uh, and the impact that could have uh, this year. It's not going to be solved by a nip and a tuck. And I would absolutely agree with Martin. It's certainly not going to be solved by entering a bidding war on how far to slash corporation tax um, or indeed to shrink the state. I mean, I really worry, not just because if we face further crises, what might happen, but we need an educated, healthy workforce. And the reality is our teachers and nurses are on their knees. So we need to think very carefully before that kind of, um, uh, I think, ridiculous uh, uh, competition. Uh, and similarly on regional equality, which clearly is really important and we have to consider place, but we should also remember that if you're a shop worker or a care worker, it doesn't much matter where you are in the country, you are facing rubbish pay and rubbish conditions on the whole. Um, I guess kind of my message is that inequality and poverty is not just a symptom of a broken economy, it's a driver that breaks that economy. Uh, we have had the longest, harshest uh, living standards squeeze. Uh, we've all seen the numbers on child poverty. We all know that the great majority have at least one parent in work. Something has gone really, really wrong. Um, uh, UK consumers, I see, racked up 800 million pounds worth of debt in May alone. That tells you something uh, in terms of that transfer of risk uh, and debt to real families uh, who are struggling to cope. So I would suggest that if we're going to fix growth and if we're going to fix inequality of income and wealth, then we also need to fix inequality of power because I don't know who else is going to be arguing for a fairer, greener economy if certain voices are excluded from the room. And we've seen that in terms of the UK's so-called flexible labour market, nearly 4 million people now on low-paid, insecure, zero hours and full self-employment type contracts. We saw that naked abuse of power with P&O when a, a crew paid the union rate for the job were unlawfully sacked and replaced with agency labour on poverty pay. And yet, lots of crocodile tears, but nothing happened. They got away with it, they priced it in, and they got away with it. What a signal to send. We've had 20 promises on 20 separate occasions, promises of an employment bill to strengthen workers' rights and deal with some of these abuses. Nothing. Instead, this week, We've had regulations instead to allow employers to replace striking workers with agency staff uh, doing a P&O, as we call it in Congress House. And of course, a threat uh, from the Brexit Freedom Bill, so-called, uh, to attack workers' EU-derived rights. And, uh, you know, read my lips. Uh, working time is top of the list with that, those rights to paid holidays, breaks and maximum working hours. So we could very well be going in the wrong direction unless we shift it. Uh, I think during the pandemic, I, think it, I know it's become a cliche almost, but it's important to say many of us learned the true value of labour. For the first time, we understood how much people who were keeping us alive, keeping us safe, got paid and how they were treated. I'm so pleased to ha hear Carolyn talk about social partnership. Uh, when Carolyn and I were working together, we, we called for a National Recovery Council. We knew it would be tough, the transition from the pandemic. We knew there were big challenges ahead. Let's all sit down together and figure out a strategy that we can agree on to rebuild Britain in a fairer, greener way. Um, that um, offer, I would describe it as, was rejected, but it's still there on the table, I, I know, with Tony Danker too. Um, and I think in many cases, if I'm honest, maybe this is me getting old, 
but I feel like so many of the solutions are so well known. You know, some of this kind of feels like common sense. We do need to see an extension of collective bargaining if we're going to start raising uh, wages. Uh, we do need sexual fair pay agreements, as we're seeing p legislation going through New Zealand at the moment. We've seen it in Ireland. We've seen it to a degree in Scotland developing and, and Wales too. We need corporate governance reform. As long as businesses are incentivised only to deliver short-term bonanzas uh, to shareholders, that's going to be a problem for us. So we need reform there. We need a proper industrial strategy, exactly as Martin said. And I would say we need to equalise capital gains tax with income tax. Um, and it's about time that we had um, some fairness in our tax system. I think we do need to build that new consensus for the long term. I think we need a vision of that greener, fairer economy that is built on skilled labour that is fairly rewarded, where everybody gets the chance of a satisfying job with enough time to spend with your families, enough time and money to bring your children up well. We all need that, and a voice at work. And I'll just end with the perhaps one of the most important issues to come out of that presentation was that the loss of worker power is costing us each £100 a week. Join a union. Thank you very much. <laughs>Understanding of context, trade-offs, scale, staying power. How are we doing uh, against that list in terms of you know, where we currently are? Because I think it gives us a feeling for the fact that we could do better. So staying power. I mean, the interesting thing here is that actually we do have staying power on this uh, in that every prime minister from Blair onwards have, have pretty well said they want to tackle these spatial disparities early on. Um, we just have no stability after that. So uh, we have no stability in the institutions, policies, programs, funding, and the current lot pretend that they're the first to care about it. Um, I mean, that, that's not brilliant. This is a sort of specific example of Carolyn's point that we've just, we have just a lot of churn, and that's not really very helpful. So uh, no staying power. Uh, are we, uh, do we have a good understanding of the context? I think it's improving. Um, but I don't think we're realistic enough about uh, what our services specialism implies for the extent of spatial disparity. So, you know, a country like ours that has a, a strong services specialism will have large productivity disparities. There's very little we can do about that. I think we have been uh, distracted by the overall extent of the disparities. Uh, at the cost of not paying enough attention to what's going on with the second cities. You know, I've, I've been working with Manchester for 15, 20 years trying to make the case that, you know, the, the, the crucial thing to narrowing these spatial disparities here is to get really serious about turning around, turning around what's happening in Manchester. Uh, are we serious on scale? I think nowhere near. Um, I mean, we've seen those numbers. You know, you, all right, you know, we're not going to put 500,000 people, uh, extra people in Manchester because we build about five houses a year, right? So you're going to have to do things on the effective size. All right, maybe that's possible. But then I don't think we're realistic at all about what would be needed on the graduate shares and the capital shares. You know, 11 percentage point increase takes <laughs> Manchester's graduate share to roughly what London's looks like. Uh, and the 30 percent increase in, in capital per worker that we estimate that you would need would take that to roughly London levels as well. And that is a huge amount of money just to fix one uh, of, our, of our struggling economies. I, I don't see anything uh, that is really serious about the scale of the challenge. Um, I don't think we're serious really about the trade-offs. I was struck at the launch that uh, even Andy, who I think you know, did some interesting analysis in the white paper, dodged it by, you know, we, we, we really have got a, a trade-off. 
uh, between natural, you know, national catch-up and narrowing those spatial disparities. I mean, you saw, you know, London is 20, 25 percent of the economy, and it sits way to the right of Paris. So, if we want the UK as a whole to catch up, London's got to be part of the story. Uh, I don't think we should ignore the other 75 percent, but you, you've got to choose what you're doing now. You know. I think you can have both if you make sensible decisions. We'll can't, you know, let's, let's just leave that if there. I mean, some of the things that are being proposed, HS2 would be uh, high on my list. Uh, you know, achieve probably neither of these things really for, for a large amount of money. I, I think you can have both, but you've definitely got to think about the speed with which you're going to uh, achieve these two objectives. And we just need to be upfront uh, about that. Now, I, I mentioned, you know, and people dodge this by saying there's good investment opportunities outside London. I mean, I will take that as given, uh, but still the scale of uh, the, the investment that we are talking about, at some point we're going to have to start being serious about that uh, trade-off uh, and where we want to be on it. Um, and the final thing is clear objectives. I still don't know what levelling up is for. Um, you know, look, it's a glib and easy thing to say as an academic, but you know, we've, we've had a white paper, and the I'm only focusing on the economic side of that now. I should sort of have a clear uh, feeling for what it's doing, and I don't really understand if it is a vehicle for improving productivity or it's a vehicle for addressing our uh, inequality problem. I, I don't know which of those it is, but what I will say is we need to get serious about which of those we're trying to achieve with these kind of policies. Because, you know, if we go for... OK, we need to offset London. Offsetting London uh, means investing spatially concentrated in somewhere like Manchester, spreading around graduates, you know, getting more graduates to live in Manchester, etc. That is just no simple fix for poor households living in Manchester. Uh, you know, I, I don't understand why we feel that trickle-down doesn't really work at the national level, but suddenly it works in spatial policy. You know, the evidence is very clear. Um, you know, Happiness is lowest in London and, our, and poverty rates are highest. So, you know, making Manchester more like London to deal with our productivity problem, you know, it does bad stuff for poverty. Uh, so there you go, that's seven minutes of just trying to be serious uh, about uh, the, the five criteria that we set out. Could we do better? I think clearly we could. Will we? Uh, I'll leave that to the panel to discuss. <laughs> Thank you very much, I think. Oh, no, you can't leave it to the panel to discuss. You literally are the panel. Anyway, you can run away and hide from the, uh, the traumas. Right, OK, we covered a lot of ground um, uh, there. I thought we'll try and vaguely go through a number of things here, right? So we're going through growth, growth up. We're going through inequality down. We're going through plausibility of anything happening slash what's the prize for it happening and how does that make us think about what an economic strategy um, looks like. Let, so let's do those in turn. Within the growth and the um, inequality side of things, I'd like us to, one of, one of the things as Henry was just setting out there that we say in the book is that being serious about an economic strategy is about reconciling yourselves to the trade-offs, right? So Henry was listing one of them there, which is say you got uh, England, because we mean England's second cities to be more successful, that would close regional productivity gaps, it would probably close regional income gaps, it would push up within region inequality, it would push up housing costs for lower earners in those cities, right? So there's like, these are trade-offs. You can either pretend they don't exist, or you can, or you can kind of pay your money and take your choice. And a strategy only looks like the latter, um, and the former looks like um, uh, well, what we're doing, basically. So, the, um, so on each of them, let's try to bring out the trade-offs, even when what we're trying to do in this project is to force ourselves to say, okay, we're not ignoring this downside, but we think we should do this anyway. Broadly, okay. So let's go through those in turn. So on um, uh, on the nature of the UK economy, okay, where as Dan points out, most conversations say the problem is we're bankers uh, and we wish we were um, Germans. Broadly, that's I mean a bit unfair, but that's basically the public policy consensus of the um, world. The, um, so my question for Carol, oh, hello, someone's got the answer. Um, so my question <laughs> from uh, uh, Carolyn is, why do we think we self-loathe? <laughs> wow. Not you, obviously. Hopefully not. But like, so, as a, as a, so, economically in society, what, what's the, what's the self love? In Germany, everyone is like, do you have any idea how shit hot we are at this tool making? Whereas here, we're like, oh, it's really awkward. It, 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 it's it's really interesting, isn't it? Because I spent a lot of my uh, career in the creative industries, 
Uh, so uh, broadcasting, making programmes, all of that. And it's very, it's very interesting. It, it was not, it was seen as kind of the, um, the, the, the decorative bit um, at any trade show. You know, they bring out a Dalek, and it was considered to be kind of eye candy for the, for the economy. And then people suddenly woke up to the fact that this was a £100 billion sector. Um, and if you go through our different service sectors, you go through creative industries, we are absolutely world-class, no doubt. I mean, look at Pinewood, look at the, uh, the, 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 the attraction of investment into the UK around all of that. But if you go through many other sectors, you, you go through architecture, you go through accountancy, you go through legal, we are absolutely fantastic. And the other thing I would say about, uh, about those kinds of services is they are actually um, UK-wide. So you go to Bristol, you go to Belfast, you will find communities, fintech, um, where we've got some new kinds of financial services. Why don't we recognise this in ourselves and want to celebrate them? Um, I think there are a couple of reasons. I think one is the financial crash was absolutely ghastly. And, um, uh, and you know, a lot of people lost their jobs and we had a real recession on the back of it. And actually, I think services just got caught up in all of that. Um, the second thing I would say is that I think we've got ourselves caught into a bifurcation where we started where we think kind of manufacturing is better. Um, and there are reasons why it's really important manufacturing, because the productivity is high, the wages are high, um, it is definitely geographically dispersed. But we've got to find a way of recognising what we're good at, celebrating them. And I've got one other little bugbear, actually, Torsten, that I will Only air. one? Uh, only one of, one, of, one of many, but this is one that's relevant to this conversation, which is that I think this distinction between services and manufacturing, frankly, is breaking down. So, you know, if you're Rolls-Royce, you make 40% of your income from services. I always thought a television programme was actually a manufactured product, <coughs> um, even though it was called a service. I wonder whether we should stop using the word services. And um, we start talking about the creative industries and the accountancy profession and, and legal. And actually, that might be a way to... to become at peace with what we're fantastic we at. We're going to rebrand ourselves out of self-loathing. I think we rebrand. I'm going to try that in my personal life. I'm going to see how it goes. The, um, uh, right, OK. The, um, now, on this, the trade-off that we focus on in the book that comes with the service economy is the, is the productivity gaps between places. And so you can't, you can't become like Germany geographically um, if you're a service-led economy, and you need to recognise that, largely because... Um, the range of places you will have very large productivity in are, are uh, more limited in that world. So, Henry, what is the, given that, given being, uh, being adult about that, where does that take you in terms of an economic strategy, in terms of making sure incomes aren't as unequal? Well, uh, I think it's, it, it does, it, 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 it must, in, to some extent, make it slightly harder. Um, because that, you know, there is a tendency to, to, to say, be like, Germany, um, and it's just I don't I don't see in what way that that is a helpful benchmark. But something that we do argue in the report is, um, you know, be more like France is, you know, they they do have a sort of set of specialisms that look like us. So I think it informs the strength of the market forces that we're up against. But I don't think it's manifest destiny that are, you know. That, that we have the disparities that we do. I think that, Can we yeah. make that concrete? Because what we're really saying is there's no reason why loads of our large cities haven't made the transition to po the post-deindustrialisation. Well, you know... Well, there are reasons, but it's, I, it's not inevitable. I think, I, I, I think this is, you know, where, whenever you have an interim report, like this, I, I think there are reasons... I don't think all of our second second cities need to be more... I, you know, I think we could, we, we could do it. I don't think that we're going to get a global city in each region. Uh, I have to say. The other thing I would say, though, is to pick up on something Francis said. If, if you're asking me a question about incomes, I, I, the, yes, the spatial disparities matter some, somewhat, but nowhere near as much as the within area individual inequality. Uh, I, now, so for me, actually, I, I actually think if we want to be serious about individual inequality, uh, there are just far more important things uh, than the uh, spatial productivity disparities okay. that we face. Very good. They have, now, Martin, so you, everyone has called for business investment. Um, uh, you set out that we could fund that without having to just borrow squillions from abroad by higher pension savings. The trade-off there is more investment, higher savings, but lower consumption for quite some time to mm -hmm. finance it. It's not a free lunch. Absolutely. Is that it? Uh, well, well, that's obvious. Um, well... <laughs> <laughs> 
That's the kind uh, of peril, list the perils <laughs> of, uh, of arithmetic. I suppose the um, if we have a very large number of very attractive investment opportunities in this country, and it uh, and we are living continue to live in a world in which, in addition, uh, interest rates are very low. Um, it is possible to imagine um, further increases in direct investment and borrowing, but we are sort of already fairly way out there among developed countries in in this. And so if we're talking about raising the, the gross investment rate in this country by several percentage points of GDP, which is, I think, what we would need to do to make a, any appreciable difference, I don't see how we can do that without funding at least a significant part of that internally. And that does indeed imply a shift from our high consumption, um, low savings model, which is obviously a very striking characteristic. Uh, in aggregate, our, our private sector saves um, rather little uh, compared with, and I'm talking both corporate and household savings, um, with uh, compared with uh, the Europeans, uh, um, and that's quite a big uh, issue, uh, in my view. And if we don't address that, we don't um, really have much to add growth. Could I just comment very, very briefly on this? I think this fascinating set of issues. I suppose, like many economists, I've tended to compartmentalize the growth challenge from the distributional challenge because it's really hard to do them both together unless you happen to be in that stage of development where labor intensive growth is natural uh, and uh, I mean it's and it's really hard without having a commitment to a, pr a significantly more funded tax distribution system than we've ever been prepared to contemplate and we've been, of course, spectacularly dishonest about that. So I do think that we we have to separate these to some degree, and that fits in with the second point and lots of others. I'm with the view that the argument we need to make for leveling up, improving average productivity in the in second-tier cities relative to London is a growth one. And if you can't make that, I wouldn't bother. Otherwise, just make London, um, you know, just uh, get rid of all the green belt, malarkey, and all the rest, and just have a proper city here, you know, of about 40 million people, like Tokyo, the Tokyo region. We could do that. And everybody else, every, the rest of the country would be nice and beautiful and green. But, I mean, that will be the efficient, <laughs> that will be the efficient thing to do. Now, I don't want to suggest that, but I think growth... <laughs> Growth is the, what we have to go for here and not regard that as a distributional issue. And final twist, I'm very sorry, but I have this theory which I've never written, and since Francis is here, I'm going to change. It does seem to me, we all dance around this, that all the sectors we think we have comparative advantage in, and we probably do, have a key characteristic. And I want somebody to prove that they don't involve cross-class cooperation. And the and that to, I'm you know I'm the child of foreigners. Uh, I've always felt class is the devil here. Why can the Germans do their manufacturing? We can't because basically people in German businesses, major manufacturing businesses, trust one another, really trust one another, and they don't here. Right. Um, uh well, it's worth pointing out that Ernie Bevan, a British trade unionist, was at least co-architect of yeah. that system. But he uh, never managed to create it here. He never tried. Well, that's even more is interesting. One of the things I that's yeah, more, I in, out with more interesting on. because they like the class war. Right. One second. Oh, Let's before we get into the class war. Wait, 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 wait. We are not doing 1940s <laughs> class war. That's that's next week's seminar. There's like a, a specialist podcast for that kind of stuff. Yeah, we agree too much. Right. We have to have an okay. Argument. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, I'm all for an argument, just not about the 1940s. Right. Now, uh, I want to bring up a question, for, Francis. You can take this one. So this is getting. You can use a class war answer if you must. Uh, if I can make the IT work, which is basically, I'll read it out. So Toby asks. Right, what are the impediments to the kind of social partnership you two massive lefty hippies are advocating? <laughs> uh, and if the government won't let you do it, why don't you just get on with it anyway, is the slightly kind of provocative question. Francis, why haven't we done it? Um, 
I think in many ways through the pandemic we did. did. Um, and we, that meant we didn't always agree by any stretch, but we disagreed well. Um, and where we did agree, I think it packed a powerful punch with a government that was frankly, if I'm honest, I think was desperate for ideas and solutions. So there was an openness that um, perhaps certainly in our case isn't there now. Um, but what are the impediments? I mean, I think, it, you know, where you see it's done successfully, there is proper architecture. Exactly. Uh, government does have convening power. And uh, whilst I think there is a lot that we can get on with and do get on with and do agree on, uh, the voluntary approach is never going to cut it for us because there are always um, some guys who are looking to undercut the decent guys. So you either have a level playing field, for example, sectoral fair pay agreements that cover whole sectors, starting, we've suggested, with social care so that we could begin to raise that level playing uh, field together. OK. Or, or you don't. The, um, right. On, um, so let's move on slightly to more directly into the inequality space. OK, so one of the arguments in the paper is that normally people talk about hard-headedness they, they find that language easier in the growth space. Uh, and the argument is they should apply it in the same way to the inequality space because basically uh, people talk a decent game about doing something about inequality, but we haven't done a very good job. Uh, firms say they're going to do their ESG uh, stuff. It doesn't make much difference while they still aren't giving their workers good notice periods for their shifts, as Dan illustrated powerfully earlier. Um, we haven't made, we've made big progress, as we were discussing in the first session on uh, the gap between the middle and the bottom in terms of hourly earnings, but not enough in terms of weekly pay at the bottom, and we haven't done much about, particularly amongst men, uh, the top basically running away. The, um, so, Francis, what does what does getting serious on inequality look like? Not all of it. I don't no, don't do the whole answer. That was a stupid. That was a stupid question. <laughs> well, Give us an, something that would be serious. I mean, I I find it fascinating the way that the middle and low income workers are being forced together. And I think we're seeing that played out, yep. actually, in some of uh, the industrial relations that we're witnessing currently. Um, and, and some of the gender aspects of that, by the way, because um, despite sometimes the media coverage, your average striker in Britain today is a middle-aged woman, um, you know, which, again, doesn't always come through. Uh, but, you know, clearly we've had this problem of rich men at the top, yep. uh, to put it crudely, um, breaking away and distorting, you know, even our averages, when we talk about averages, it does now make a difference what's happening at the top. Um, so that's where I come back to the issue of power, um, because I think that does matter and doesn't get talked about enough. There are structural things we need to change. There are structural proposals we're making in terms of the welfare state, the labour market, and so on. But there's also an issue about whose voice gets heard. Um, but you know, we have, I mean, a, a less charitable way of putting it is that we've had an investment strike for many, many years yep. in this country that's done far more damage, frankly, than even the most right-wing newspaper would try to describe about any did. workers' strike. Um, and that's where I also come back to corporate governance. It's not a very glamorous subject always, but I actually think who writes the rules and what those rules say is really, really important for how Great. companies behave. Let's, let's bring up a poll question while people in the room want to ask questions, get their hands up and we can get some microphones to you. So here's the question. I'll ask the panel as we go. Right, so we've talked about what it, a plausible approach to this might look like in much more detail in the book. Read it. The, um, do, we, uh, do we as a country actually want to do it or are we basically fine with the status quo? And because we're reasonable people, we provide another option, which is... If you don't want to get totally depressive, then may, like, maybe we would be in future, basically. The, um, uh, and by that, we mean, on this question, we really mean the book basically says it, there, is a, there are plausible strategies. They're not easy. It'll be, it's politically difficult. It's substantively difficult. It involves more change. There's some losers. The, um, so, Carolyn, do we want to do it or not while everyone votes? And people, get your hands up in the room if you want to ask a question. You've got loads. Um, yes, no, or not right now. Uh, and not, I don't mean today. Like this decade, this decade? Uh, not right now. Certainly not a yes. It's between the no and not right now, but we've got to, t we've got to change that. Okay. So not right now, but we have to change it. Okay. Martin? No. Excellent. Thank you. Francis? People do, yes. Oh, so he did that. <laughs> <laughs> Henry? Yeah, I'm going not right now. Okay. Well, the, um, I'm going to, just to perk everyone up a little bit. Um, the, uh, 
obviously, as I'm often saying, we've got like a slightly silly tax cut discussion at the moment, which is the silver bullet for every economic problem. But one thing the election, the election is doing is people saying the status quo isn't okay about a government they've been in. Right? The opposition saying the status quo is not okay. Rachel Reeves is coming in a bit. Just a little, you know, guess. I think she's going to say the status quo is not okay. <laughs> right? The leader, people that want to be the prime minister, are saying that. Anyway, but you know, what do I know? Right? You're all voting on that. Let's get some questions. Where's the microphone? Let's take a three questions. So there's two here. Got a lot of men. Isn't there a connection between the abysmal levels of investment by industry and the retreat of pension funds and insurance companies from investing in industry? You've got four trillion sitting around in these things doing to first approximation nothing. And if something could be done to get them investing into industry in general and high growth okay. industry in particular, wouldn't that make a big difference to both sides of the equation, the savings and the investment? Okay, you're going to make Martin very happy. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, John McDonough from Recrow Consulting, which is an employability and recruitment solutions business. I want to join a couple of dots up and give you a silver bullet with a, with a question. Um, and talking about the hope and also the cause and resolution, which I think Linda talked about earlier. I think it was 2010 when Islington Council did the Fairness Commission and they had a book called The Spirit Level in terms of why equality matters to everybody, which has got graphs quite like you guys. And Islington tried, but then it got difficult and nothing really happened. And I think, whether we like it or not, the public sector owns a lot of this, but they get stuck. And as soon as it gets difficult, the navel becomes very interesting and they just go into denial or, or whatever else. And we've got to change that thinking and behaviour. But who leads that? Because Whitehall is full of resistance. PM show a side at the moment if we think a minister's going to come in okay. and, and sort that out. They can't I do it. To the question, sir, because I'm going to run out of time. Shift the intent. Who presses go? Who presses go? Good question. To shift the intent and get action. Very good. And there's a question just here. So actually, and can we take a question from over there as well? Just Louise, go around to the side because I'd like to take one from the woman. Life's not about being first, Rachel. Let's have the question. No, it's about, it's about being in the middle, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, so just a quick question uh, about one thing that you mentioned and one thing that you didn't, both of which actually this government has talked about. Um, so the first is devolution. You talked a lot about policy churn. We're a very centralized country with a very centralized department running that centralized country. How much of a difference does it make? And the one you didn't seem to mention, which I'm a little surprised given David is in the room, uh, is R&D and innovation, which uh, if you look at the last 40, 50 years, it feels like the economy's changed quite a lot because stuff got invented. We do reasonably well at this. Why wasn't it on the list? Yeah, good. The, um, uh, right, let's take those in turn. So um, Martin, on, on financing, of that investment, let's combine that question with one from Pauline online, which basically says, Martin, could you please develop on why you believe there should, we shouldn't be our debt reliance as a problem, basically? Uh, there are so many dimensions of this, so I'll just, I can't possibly get through in the time available. So let just me focus on um, a distinction in relationship to pension funds between what I might think of as the stock problem and the flow problem. Um, the, we have decided essentially to impose a set of regulations which has led to the, and the characteristic of it is that corporations had to guarantee effectively their ability to pay pensions in all circumstances. And given the nature of the promise, that couldn't be done. It can't be done anyway, but the, the only plausible way you can do that, close to a guarantee, is to go into bonds. And at, once you're in that world, uh, all pension promises become unaffordable. You therefore close down, close your pensions. They become closed-end funds. Because the returns are lower. Uh, because, uh, exactly. Uh, I won't go into the nature of this mistake. I think it's a very profound mistake, and it's mostly responsibly of financial economics, which is, I think, a very serious set of errors, but we can't go into that now. So the anyway, the upshot is we... Um, we close them down from a flow point of view. Savings don't go through them anymore uh, because there are no new contributions. And they have a stock 
which of assets which goes essentially into the UK government's bond market. And that's the end of the pension industry. Um, and we can't change that without completely and utterly changing all our regulations. Completely, totally. Uh, now that's, that's ancient history, I think. I don't think we can reverse this. So we've now gone into these defined contribution systems. And the problem is they don't save enough and they're individualized and there is therefore no large funds able to make large strategic bets of the type that, for instance, the Canadians and the Dutch and others have, which I think solves quite a number of quite important collective action problems, but I won't go into that. Okay. And so, in essence, what I'm saying is we have to rethink again. Adair did quite a nice job 20 years ago, but we have to rethink again what we want from our long term savings system, it's unbelievably important, and I think we've ossified our capital markets as a byproduct of these very serious policy mistakes, which, by the way, when they happened, nobody was aware or thought about the consequences and go back about uh, 30 years. Um, why didn't I mention R&D? It was one of my points, but Torsen already thought I was talking too I long. I did, I did, so let's wrap up. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, not too long, just, just yes, too long. Right, okay, quickly, Carolyn, who needs to do the doing? So, like, Whitehall's not going to sort it out. We've got some politician pessimism. Where's the doing going to happen? Um, we, I think that the business community can do quite a lot of doing, but frankly, we've got to create the felt need for change. And that's, part, that's a lot of what this is about. I think this is a moment in time where we've got to say enough is enough uh, and um, that's how we can get the change. On the, on the R&D point, I have to say, I think it's actually an example of where you have got quite a lot of cross-party consensus now about public sector investment. It's about how you get the private sector to crowd in now. Right, good. Right, now Francis, last one to you. Centralisation, is that the problem? We wouldn't make, maybe like all the policy churn people have talked about here, how much is the centralisation means there's not enough grit in the oyster to stopping people kind of moving things 100 degrees at a time. You can't do it, 90 degrees. I'm, I'm all in favour of, of that. However, I have to say politically, I think we're at a point where somebody somewhere is going to have to start thinking about what binds the UK together. Uh, I, I've always felt there was a, a risk uh, following Brexit that you know this great victory for the UK could end up rebranding as EW England and Wales uh, and it's just a matter of time but you know that that kind of appetite for more local involvement for people to listen to be able to get a grip on what needs to be done I, I can see all that and have a lot of sympathy for it just one point on R&D if, if we are in this predominantly service economy, can we please remember that a lot of this comes back to people? And when you've got an HE sector that is currently engaged in real conflict because of pay for sure, but also pensions and insecure contracts, that damages us all. All know? the academics are nodding. <laughs> uh, give us our pensions, they're saying. Right, OK, I'm going to wrap us up with the results of that poll from everybody, and then we're going to hear how the Labour Party is going to solve all of it in a second. Yeah. Right, you're a bunch of pessimists, basically. Thanks a lot, people. Look, I think you need to perk up a bit. The, um, because they were, like, it's definitely not automatic that countries turn around uh, their stagnation. But you, we should have taken from the back end of Dan's presentation that we don't need to transform ourselves. We just need to start doing yeah. a bit better. Year on, it's a hard task. It isn't a silver bullet. It doesn't happen like all in one go. But doing a bit better will make a massive difference, and particularly make a massive difference to low and middle income households. So perk up, everyone. And on that note, can you thank the panel? <laughs>